Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Oh, welcome back to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown. Across the table is my good friend, Matthew. It is I. Matthew Stockton, how are you today? I'm very good. How are you today? Well, I'm not bad. My cats are running me ragged. They, I have love, to, they love my shoes. They love your shoes. I have to come in here to take a break from them. It's nice and cool in here <laughs> Yeah, today. it's cool because we have the air conditioner in here. But we have to turn it off just for you folks. We suffer for our art. We suffer for the audience. Yes, and for you. <laughs> the views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, Odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work. Family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. During the harsh winter of 1941, as World War II raged elsewhere, closer to home, a tragedy occurred on the remote, ice-covered island archipelago in Hudson Bay called the Belcher Islands. After witnessing a dramatic meteor shower, a tribal group of Inuit people believed the world was ending, and, inspired by a copy of the New Testament Bible translated into Inuit syllabics by Anglican missionaries, 27-year-old Charlie Uyurak, self-professed shaman of the tribe, claimed he was the second coming of Jesus Christ. Charlie determined his friend Peter Sala, a skilled hunter and navigator, to be God. Their cult, Charlie, Peter, Peter's sister Mina, and their followers, labeled any deniers as satanic heretics, eventually leading to the brutal murders of nine people within the group. You're listening to Dark Poutine episode 233, Falling Stars, The Belcher Island Murders. Administratively, belonging to the Kikwiktaluk region of the territory of Nunavut, the Belcher Islands lie in the southeast part of Hudson Bay near the center of the Nastapoka Arc, about 130 kilometers from the coast of Quebec. The rugged rocks comprising the 1,500 low-lying islands range in age from 1.6 to 2.3 billion years old. Archaeologists have determined that a group labeled the Dorset culture inhabited the islands from 500 BCE until 1000 CE. 200 years after that, in 1200 CE, the people we now associate with the Inuit culture settled there, using the islands as a base for fishing and hunting expeditions. The first European to discover the islands was English explorer Henry Hudson, the namesake of Hudson Bay, who sighted the island in 1610. Colonialists named the islands after Royal Navy Admiral Sir Edward Belcher, who lived between 1799 and 1877. However, the Inuit people still call the archipelago Senikiluak, which is also the name of its largest settlement. So it's not named after the Belchers from Bob's Burgers. No. And I think... It, do, 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 I love do. Bob's Burgers. Me too. But no, it is not named after those Belchers. And I think the Belchers are named for belching. 
I don't know. Um, um, maybe they're related to Sir Edward Belcher. Could be. I'm going to write to the show and ask. You should. Thanks to a view from space provided by NASA's Landsat 7 satellite, captured in the summer of 2000, we can see that the Belcher Islands archipelago looks like a meandering brown smear in the waters of Hudson's Bay. From earthobservatory.nasa.gov, quote, Looking vaguely like marbled paper, the Belcher Islands meander over some 1,300 square kilometers, 5,000 square miles, in southeastern Hudson Bay, but within that area, only 2,896 square kilometers, 1,118 square miles, is dry land. The mostly brownish hues of the land areas in this image attest to a lack of vegetation. Cold temperatures prevent the growth of robust forests. The deep waters of the Hudson Bay appear almost black, with the exception of shallower areas close to the land which appear peacock blue. Yeah, they do look like marbled paper, and you know when you mix two paints together? Mm -hmm. And you pour the one, and then you start stirring, and then yeah. you see them. It looks like that. They're like actually... oil and water, maybe, yeah, too. Yeah, it's kind of quite beautiful. Yeah. Uh, peacock blue, eh? Peacock blue. As far north as the islands are and due to a lack of adequate soil, not much flora can grow there. However, there are a few small plants, mostly shrubbery of the willow family. In addition, there are a few animals on the islands and in the waters surrounding them, which include belugas, walrus, caribou, which are mostly gone now, common eiders, known as Cuddy's duck, and snowy owls. Several fish species in the water around the islands include Arctic char, cod, capelin lumpfish, and sculpin. A soapstone quarry on one of the islands supplies local indigenous carvers with high-quality stone for their beautiful, intricate, and in-demand artworks. Do you remember the 70s and 80s? Yeah, I do remember, the, well, parts of them. And how soapstone carvings were everywhere. Yeah, pretty much everybody's house had a little Kind soapstone. of ruined it. And I used to like thought, oh, I hate soapstone carvings. But what I realized is I hate tourist tat. Like yeah. if you look at that, like saying I hate soapstone carvings is like saying I hate paintings. Right? Yeah. The the proper stuff done by the actual the art artists, is, they're quite beautiful. Yeah. There was, there was some mass produced stuff that was just made for uh, souvenirs and those kind of things. But there are actual really beautiful artwork. Uh, done in lots of museums and art galleries of yeah. soapstone. Yeah. Yep. In summer, when the waters are relatively ice-free, kayaking is the favored mode of transportation between the Belcher Islands. This area traditionally utilized two-person kayaks. In winter, the traditional method of transportation across the ice is the familiar dog sled. The paper, The Belcher Islands of Hudson Bay, Their Discovery and Exploration by Robert J. Flaherty, published in 1918, gives a colonialist look at the people living on the islands during the 20th century. Flaherty was an American filmmaker who later directed and produced the first commercially successful feature-length documentary film, Nanook of the North, in 1922. Note, some of the language used in the following quote is racist and shows ignorance and a marked lack of perspective typical of colonial writings at the time. Quote, the Eskimos, native to the islands, are called Itivimiat, or mainland tribe. Of these, there are not more than five families, the remainder of the population, 20 families or so, being made up of mainlanders, attracted by the walrus grounds and seafowl rookeries, have from time to time emigrated to the islands. The tribes are not radically different. The most noticeable difference between them is not so much the dialect as the manner of speaking. The islanders speak more slowly, as Harold, I don't know who Harold is, aptly expressed it, they have the speech of children. Since the disappearance of the caribou from the islands, the population, for want of deer skin, has had recourse for clothing in winter to the feathered skins of eider duck and sea pigeon. These materials are inferior in wearing quality, heavier, and too warm for even the coldest weather. Furthermore, to the white man's nose, they are most obnoxious. The summer clothing, fashioned according to custom principally from seal skins, is not distinctive, nor are their implements, sleds, and kayaks different from those used in the mainland. End quote. Flaherty states how his group taught the Inuit people on the islands to prospect for iron ore, a valuable resource throughout the region. He also wrote about using a portable projector to show the local population a film made of Baffin Island to communicate his intent of filming on the Belcher Islands. Flaherty wrote that the audience who crowded into the hut to watch the film was, 
quote, enthusiastic. Flaherty wrote, quote, Their aes and ahs at the ways of their kindred that were strange to them were such as none of the strange and wonderful ways of the Kablunak, white man, ever called forth. The deer especially, Tuktu, they cried, mythical to all but the eldest among them, held them spellbound, end quote. Flaherty commented that the people were skilled hunters and navigators who were peaceful, friendly, and honest in their dealings with him and his group. Flaherty's group utilized the locals, quote, for services and film work and exploration, for dogs and dog driving, end quote, and game hunting to keep the expedition members fed. In return, they were paid in several tons of goods, consisting of flour, pork, sea biscuit, grease, sugar, tea, tobacco, cheap candy, finery, knives, axes, files, Winchester 44 carbines, powder and shot, nails, and other bits of hardware. Cheap candy? Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> why like, specifically? Why do they call it cheap candy? They don't say, like, cheap knives. What, what would cheap candy be? I don't know what cheap candy what, what's would be your, like. like what's, what's your least favorite chocolate bar? My least favorite chocolate bar? Do you have one? Um, do I don't you, know or, if I or do. Or do you like all the chocolate bars? Well, I love chocolate bars, but I can't think of one that I really don't like. Mounds. Oh, I love mounds. Ugh. Almond Joys get nuts. Mounds no, don't. Yeah, exactly. Other chocolate bars available. Yeah, exactly. My favorite is Crunchy. So, Matthew, yeah. I bought Crunchy Spread the other day. <gasps> no. So it's like a, it comes in a glass jar because it's fancy, but it is spread with the crunchy bits in it, chocolate mm. with the crunchy bits in it. So if you want a sandwich later, you can where have. Did, uh, where did you get it? On Amazon. I'm going to look it up. You can, I saw it in the UK for sale. I'll have, to hide, I'll have to hide it from Justin. Yeah, it's really good. It's not in his vision of what I should be eating. <laughs> not in his vision? He of told me I'm overweight and it's because I don't exercise or, and I eat too much. And I told him it's far more likely to be an allergy to something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to our story. Okay, sorry. The way Flaherty described the population of the Belcher Islands, they do not seem like the type of people who just over 20 years later would be involved in a bloody pseudo-Christian death cult, but it happened. Like all indigenous cultures, the Inuit people have a rich cultural heritage, often passed down orally from one generation to the next. Much passed from Inuit elders includes practical tips on surviving in the harsh climate. For example, young people learn about the building of shelter and the importance of using all parts of a prey animal. The aims of Inuit mythology are also geared heavily toward their people's survival and linking people to the traditions of their ancestors. The moon often plays a central role in Inuit mythology. According to astro-canada.ca, Inuit legends are full of stories and characters. One such story from the Inuit of Canadian Central Arctic tells how light first appeared on Earth. Quote, In the beginning... Darkness was everywhere. There was no light on earth, and it was impossible to see the ground, the animals, or humans. Strangely enough, however, an animal could transform into a human and a human into an animal. There were several different animals like bears, hares, and foxes, but when these animals became human, they all became the same. They spoke the same language, lived in the same style of home, and hunted the same way. It was during this time that magic words were created. A word mentioned casually during a conversation could suddenly acquire magical powers, and nobody could explain how or why. One day, a fox and hare were arguing. The fox kept repeating darkness, because he liked how he could use the dark to steal the hunting catches of the humans. On the other hand, the hare kept repeating daylight, because he needed light to help him find food. Suddenly the light shone, and the darkness disappeared, to be replaced by day. The word repeated by the hare had stronger magic than the fox's word. Since then, night and day take turns shining over earth, and the fox and the hare take turns finding food as well. I love little stories like that, don't mm. you? It's interesting, like um, this, this, this mythology. I do like stories like that. Mm -hmm. But um, and I'll, we'll talk about this a bit later. Like their hunting culture, mm -hmm. right? And they're much closer to animals than we are, or... Th you know, we used to be right. as well. So often the mythology mm -hmm. is connected to animals and respect for animals and the idea of like, you're kind of the same yep. in a lot of ways. So I loved how like, you know, fox and hare, animals, people, all of, all of this sort of work together. But that, 
there's always origin stories and there's always stories about daylight and nighttime in yeah, every culture. Exactly. Yep. Within Inuit culture, the keepers of these great myths and interpreters of signs of nature were shamanistic spiritual figures called Angakok. For example, it was up to an Angakok to determine why fish and other marine animals had become scarce, why hunters and anglers were unsuccessful in their efforts. They also looked to the stars for answers and had developed a detailed astrological practice giving cultural significance to constellations, planets, the sun, and the moon. During their training, the Angakuk would also gain a familiar or spirit guide who would be visible only to them. This guide, called Turngak in the Inuit religion, would at times give them extraordinary powers. Inuit stories tell of Agekuit, that's plural for Angakuk, who would run as fast as caribou or who could fly with the assistance of their Turngak. In some traditions, the Angakuk would be either stabbed or shot, receiving no wound because of the intervention of their turn gag, thus proving their power. Until spiritual guidance or assistance was needed, an Angakuk lived a normal life for an Inuit, participating in society as a normal person. But when sickness needed to be cured or divination of the causes of various misfortunes was needed, the Angakuk would be called on. The services of the Angakuit might also be required to interpret dreams. If they were called to perform actions that helped the entire village, the work was usually done freely. But if they were called to help an individual or family, they would usually receive remuneration for their efforts. Anyone, regardless of gender, could become an Angakuk. But it was more typically a male endeavor. Often, a child was chosen by an elder Angakuk and trained to become a shaman. However, there are instances of people becoming an Angakuk after a dream or vision, sometimes but not always, involving prompts from dead ancestors to take on the responsibility of spiritually leading a tribal group. So yeah, that's interesting. So they tended to be male. Mm -hmm. And um, we know that in mythology and hunter cultures, right. they tend to be kind of male gods often mm -hmm. and male shamans, if you will. Sure. But in gatherer cultures, some, some are more tropical, for example. Right. There's a lot more female gods and female shamans. Mm -hmm. Because they're... It's about the hierarchy of society. Or, who's or, more or, important in feeding us. Yeah, who, who's providing. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's fascinating. One of these spontaneously inspired Angakooks was a 27-year-old named Charlie Uyurak. He was a short man of lower status and relatively unimportant to the small band of people he was encamped with until he was called on that fateful night in 1941. According to later testimony, those present at the camp during January 26 and 27, 1941 were Charlie Uyurak, 27, and his wife Annie and their two children. Kugvit, 42, and his wife Annie and four children. Shuluskuk, a.k.a. Daniel, 50, and his wife Kukudluk and four children. Mark Shulusuk, 24, and his wife Kalit. Moses Apokok, 49, he was a widower and there with five of his children. Peter Sala, 34, and his wife with their four children. Alec Kitoyak, 26, also known as Alec Epuk, Adlekok, 25, and his wife Louisa Ikaluk, Akinik, a widow, age unknown, Alec Apokok, 24, and his wife Mary, Inukpuk, 25, and his four children, Moses, 22, and his wife Mina, who was the sister of Peter Sala. It had been a harsh winter. The group's hunters struck out again and again when seeking food. Caribou, of course, were long gone from the region, Killed off in the 1880s after a frozen rain cut off their winter food supply, Cladonia lichens. This year, the seals, walrus, and even the hares were so scarce that people were starving. According to Lawrence Millman's book, At the End of the World, a survivor of the later unfortunate events told him that a woman who'd been nursing a baby had gone so long without food that her breast milk had turned green and dried up. The group was looking to their local Angakok for answers to their plight. Thanks to Anglican missionaries, a copy of the New Testament of the Bible had made its way into the small campsite. It had come by way of a long-ago visit to the mainland. Missionaries had carefully translated the book into Inuit syllabics to reach the Inuit people. 
But as there were no missionaries around to interpret the meaning of the stories for them, the Inuit read the mystical tales using their own cultural lens. Nevertheless, the locals did find some solace in the stories. According to Millman, they referred to Jesus as a white man's Angakuk. End quote. Because I know that we're going to talk a bit later about how, oh, there was a misinterpretation, right? Right. But that's kind of the history of the Bible, right? Yeah. So, you know, no one around to interpret the meaning from those who wrote it before sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And everyone reads the words on the page sort of through their own cultural lens. You, you can't not do it. That's right. And, you know, the Anglican missionaries translated it from their English interpretation of right. it. But the Bible, the Old Testament and the New was written, as we know, in Aramaic, Hebrew and Greek mm -hmm. over about a thousand years. Right. So, I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating. So the, the Eloist writers, they, they, they're called this because of the... The Elohim. Yep. The Elohim. Yep. Most likely wrote a fair bit of Exodus and Numbers in Genesis chapter 1 around 900 BC. So the hell and brimstone Old Testament yeah. stuff. And um, the, 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 the J authors, uh, they call them that because of... Um, they call God, God Jawa, which is a German translation of Yawa. Mm-hmm. Uh, wrote the majority of the first five books around 600 BC mm -hmm. during the Jewish captivity of Babylon. And then the P authors, known as Priestly, wrote some of Genesis again and some Exodus and mostly all of Leviticus and Numbers and using a lot of a Aramaic words in the late century. And it goes on and on and on, right? Mm -hmm. So there are lots of different books and texts. And e even the New Testament was first assembled in around 200 AD. Yeah. It's called the Miratonian Canon. It was yes. the earliest compl uh, compilation of texts that resemble what we see as the New Testament now. Yeah. But it wasn't even... And this is kind of recent, Mike, right? Like, yeah. Like, it was, it was like in the last part of the 5th century AD that most churches started to, like, agree on what the biblical canon was. Yeah, I mean, there's other books that are out there that could have been included but weren't. So to put all of these words into, into words that we understand, a bunch of men decided what goes in and what goes out. Right. The editors. Yeah. And of course, uh, the edit would have had reflected the times of the people. Correct. Right? So, each edit, each new edit. Absolutely. Yep. So my point being... Right? Because I know this is going to be chucked at the Inuit people. Right. These aren't some poor backwards people who put their own spin on it because they're natives, right? Right. All cultures have. Every single all cultures culture. do. Yep. And the bastardization of Christianity happens within all cultures that have it. But it also happens in, in all the Abrahamic religions, you know, it is Islam, Judaism, Christianity, and even the Dharmic religions. If people misinterpret things the wrong way and kind of take it to the dark side, yeah, it, we've all done it. So this everybody does. So this is not some sort of like nope. these backwards people, nope. which I'm sure a lot of people jumped on that bandwagon. You know what it is. You know when we're talking about the fox and the hare and those stories. Mm -hmm. I think something happens when teachings are written, mm. um, and over time they become um, considered. Um, they become dogmatic. It becomes a dogma. And literalist. Mm -hmm. it, oh, the words on the page mean the word on the page. Well, no, the words on the page, in my interpretation of the Bible, because I've, you know... I'm There's a spiritual key. Matthew's search for meaning, right? Mm -hmm. I've, yep. I've read lots of things. I, I read the Old Testament, and then I thought I'd read the Torah, and then felt ripped off because I didn't realize it was the, the same, same thing, thing way yeah. back then. So from that point, I just read and read and read mm -hmm. and read. And to me, it's... The stories are the finger pointing to the moon, and you're supposed to be looking at the moon, not the finger. And what people are doing now is they're looking at the finger often, right? Like more often. Does that than make not. sense to you? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But interestingly, there is a part in the New Testament in which, and uh, I, we don't mean to be giving a biblical studies. <laughs> Hell, why not? <laughs> seminar here. <laughs> but there's a part in the New Testament in which. Jesus is attributed as having said, the letter killeth and the word giveth life. Mm -hmm. So it's like, don't look at what's written. Think about what's written. Yeah. What is the, what, what is the message here? Because it's all, the whole point for me mm -hmm. was it's, it's, it's the inner journey. It's not right. the outer journey. It's right. not about things actually coming down from the sky. That's why I struggle with religion, somebody telling me how to interpret yeah. anything. Because I, I struggle. I have struggled with that and yeah. I can't. I can't do it. You know, and I, I celebrate anyone who's like trying to find meaning in this world. Mm -hmm. I celebrate it. Yeah. Right. But 
you know, but if they're doing it for themselves, if they're, if they're trying to be a better person versus forcing it on others. Yeah. Yeah. James C. Morton's blog about this story states, quote, The Bible offered the promise of salvation. It said Christ would come to earth to save their souls. To some, this message signaled an imminent rescue from the hardships of a perilous winter, end quote. So for about a week before the meteor shower, Charlie, Peter, and Alec Apocock had been fervently preaching that Jesus would return to rescue the group and that they no longer needed material things to survive. Material possessions were the tools of Satan and the Almighty would provide for them and they should stop hunting. Charlie said that the whole reason they had been in trouble in the first place was a test of their faith. The men had taken extreme action to make a sacrifice and show that they were faithful to the Almighty. They killed some of their sled dogs and destroyed one of their rifles, and those were important tools to them of survival. We've seen this before. We? we have seen this a lot of times before. The book Religious Frenzy and the Application of Canadian Law, The Belcher Island Murders, 1941, edited by Cora Lynn Hodgson and P. Whitney Lackenbauer, relates what happened next. On January 26, 1941, a meteor shower punched through the spectacular night sky. Lit up by the northern lights that danced above the small camp at Flaherty Island of the Belcher Islands group of the Inuit peoples. Group members had been looking to the Bible for answers to their situation. Very recently, huddled together in one of their ice houses, a.k.a. igloos, the group had read a verse in Matthew 24. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory, end quote. Charlie Uyarak, who thought himself a shaman, saw the shower of falling stars as a significant sign. The heavens were calling to him with a truth. After the meteor shower, Charlie suddenly cried, I am Jesus Christ. I am Jesus Christ. Soon after his vision, Charlie claimed that God would bring about the end of the world in short order and that all who wanted salvation should follow him. He said his friend Peter Sala was God. Peter agreed with Charlie's assessment. He was the group's largest, most physically powerful man. And in addition, he was well known for his navigation and hunting prowess and would be a powerful ally for the newly self-proclaimed Christ, Charlie Uyarak. These declarations set the group on a path that would soon see nine of their numbers perish at the hands of Charlie Uyarak and his followers. And we'll take a break right here. And we are back. Matthew, thoughts. So this is where it's starting. Yeah. So Charlie Uyarak. Yeah. So he was a shaman. Self-professed, yep. Yeah, he was not not one of those ones who was determined to have been a shaman by another older Angakok. He was one who saw himself as a shaman. Okay. So he saw himself as a shaman. Mm -hmm. And then when things are hard and they're reading the Bible, he sees himself as Jesus. Right. So he, what he did was he jumped from, from one thing to another. So he, yeah, it, because Jesus was the white man's Angakok. So kind of the same thing in his head. Right. So was there mental health issues or was he maybe um, had a... I don't think... ...view of himself of more important than, more importance than he really was? Maybe. And, and... I mean, delusion doesn't necessarily indicate no. mental health issue because we see a lot of people with delusional ideas who go to work and come home yeah. and feed their families and all that kind of stuff. So he was already kind of delusional in, in that he thought he was a hangercock and then he just jumped it up to Jesus. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, and then his, then his buddy. Peter. Yeah, Peter Sala. So why, would, why do you think Peter would go, yeah, okay, right, I'm God. Well, maybe Peter was swept up in the religious fervor that Charlie was preaching. I mean, it's hard to know somebody's mind. Yeah, but like jumping, like even if you're reading the Bible, even some weird interpretation mm -hmm. of it, I can see some people going, oh my God, I'm the second coming of Christ. Yep. But going, the other one going, I'm God, that's really kind of up there. <laughs> well, 
Maybe it <laughs> is, maybe I mean? it isn't. Yeah. And I just know where this is going to go. And it's horrible. Yeah. Survivors later shared their recollections of what happened next with the RCMP and investigators. Charlie and company began polling the group to see if there were non believers among them who had minds tainted by satanic thoughts. Alec Apocock, one of Charlie's most fervent disciples, saw that his 13 year old sister Sarah was uncomfortable with the conversation. So Alec turned on Sarah and asked if she believed Charlie was Jesus and Peter was God. Sarah emphatically said no, she didn't believe it. Alec screamed at Sarah, If you don't agree, you will die. Sarah continued to deny the divinity of the two men. From Peter Sala's statement given to the RCMP in the spring of 1941, quote, So Alec Apocock pulled her over near Charlie and himself. Alec Apocock pulled her head up by the hair. While holding her there, Alec hit Sarah on the shoulder with an inotuk, a stick used for beating snow off clothing, until she fell unconscious. Peter said that he didn't exactly see where Alec had hit her as it was dark. Sarah fell to the floor without speaking. After that, Mina, Peter's sister, and the widow, Akinik, dragged Sarah outside by the arms to another igloo. Peter said he didn't see any more, but he heard Sarah groaning, accompanied by loud thuds. Other witnesses said the widow, Akinik, and Mina beat Sarah on the head with a rifle, and then she died. Sarah's body was not buried, but left in the igloo where the killing occurred. James C. Morton wrote on his blog article about the events, quote, Akinik came back into the igloo, and I heard her say her hands were cold from holding the rifle barrel, another witness told police. Everyone was pleased. They all said, let us be thankful that Satan is gone, end quote. 46-year-old Kitoyak was disgusted by the attack and murder of Sarah just for speaking her truth. He said he was also no believer and tried to leave the igloo. At this point, Charlie Uyurai flew into a rage and attacked the older man. Kitoyak managed to get away and made his way out of the igloo, his parka in tatters from Charlie's frenzied attack. He stayed outside briefly, but decided he wanted to go back into the meeting to give his opinion and try to talk sense with Charlie, Peter, and their followers. It's unclear what Kitoyak's real motive was to return, as he did not survive to tell his side of the story. He might have hoped he could sway some of those that might have been on the fence about Charlie. But when Kitoyak poked his head back into the igloo through an opening, Peter Salas smashed him in the face with a large piece of wood. Kitoyak, now wounded and bleeding, went back to his igloo where he stayed for the rest of the night. The meeting continued and included more discussion about what to do with the non-believers like Kitoyak. An RCMP report submitted in the spring of 1941 documented Kitoyak's fate. It was written by RCMP Inspector D.J. Martin of G Division and based on witness statements. The next day, Peter Sala looked into the igloo where Kitoyak had retired the previous day and saw him sitting in a bent-over position. Peter Sala pushed in a steel-tipped sealing harpoon and prodded Kitoyak with him. Kitoyak did not move or look up at his tormentor. Peter Sala then hit him on the side of the head, his left side, with the harpoon. Adelaicock was nearby during this episode with Charlie Uriak's gun in his hand. He asked for and received a cartridge from Charlie Uriak. Adelaicock then reached into the igloo and shot Katoyak through the shoulder, and Katoyak moved only slightly. Adelaicock asked for and received another cartridge and shot Katoyak through the head, apparently killing him. The rifle was a 4440 caliber. Katuyak's body was not buried, but left in the igloo. On February 9, 1941, Charlie and his group had moved, and he was preaching to another group at Tukarak Camp on Tukarak Island. Charlie told the people gathered there that he was Jesus Christ and apparently had usurped Peter Sala's short-lived divinity and was now also referring to himself as God. Peter was not present for this meeting. Again, most people present seemed to buy into what Charlie Uyarak was saying. However, there was one vocal naysayer. Alec Kitoyak, aged 26, and his wife Eva did not seem impressed by Charlie's raving. Others in the group, including Eva's father, Kwarak, hurled insults at the couple, even threatening to kill them. From RCMP Inspector D.J. Martin's report, Eva apparently acquiesced just enough to save herself from being disposed of as an unbeliever. 
Alec Katoyak, however, held out against Charlie Uryak's statements that he was God and was called names by Charlie Uryak and held up to the other natives as a devil. Charlie Uryak told Quarak, Alec Katoyak's father-in-law, Katoyak is no good. Shoot him. Alec Katoyak, defending his position, quarreled with Quarak, stating he believed in God, but not that Charlie Uryak was God. Far from it. Charlie Uryak exited the igloo and called for Alec to come outside. Alec came out and Korak followed, rifle in hand. Other meeting attendees did not want to miss what was happening and came outside to watch. Charlie told Alec to leave and that he should walk away without looking back. Wanting nothing more to do with Charlie and likely in fear of his life, Katuyak did as Charlie told him. Charlie then said to Quarak, Go ahead and shoot him. As the group looked on, Quarak carefully aimed his 30-30 rifle, and as his son-in-law Alec walked away, Quarak shot him in the back. Alec fell to the ground, rolling around and moaning in pain. Charlie screamed at Quarak to shoot Alec again as he wasn't dead. Quarak stepped closer to the writhing man and fired again, but Alec just moaned more loudly. Charlie demanded Quarak finish the job. Quarak followed orders, walked up to Alec, and put a bullet through his brain with a point-blank rifle shot. The group returned to the communal igloo, where they spent the rest of the night rejoicing the death of the non-believer, Alec Katuyak. So sad. It is terrible. When Peter Sala and another group arrived the next day, Peter suggested that someone should bury Alec's body. Quarak and a couple of others from the group placed rocks over the corpse. Over the next couple months, Peter's sister Mina became Charlie's most staunch supporter. Mina had a vision that, per Charlie's teachings, the group had to prove their faith to the Almighty. On March 29, 1941, the group had set up camp on Camsel Island, a smaller island in the Belcher Archipelago, about seven miles southeast of their previous base at Tukarak Island. Quarak and his daughter Eva were out on the sea ice ceiling. Wow, that's hard to say. <laughs> sea ice ceiling. Sea ice. <laughs> they were out on the sea ice ceiling. So hunting seals. <laughs> Peter Sala was off with a Hudson's Bay Company patrol looking for seals as well, and Charlie was off hunting also. From RCMP Inspector D.J. Martin's report, between 11 and noon, Mina, wife of Moses and sister of Peter Sala, began to tell the other women and children of the camp that Jesus was coming and to take off their clothes and go out onto the sea ice to meet him. By threats and gesticulations, Mina forced the following out onto the ice. Kamudluk Sarah, Mina's widowed sister, age 32. Nakarak, Mina's mother, age 55. Johnny, Peter Sala's adopted son, age 7. Jonasi, son of Kamukluk Sarah, age 6 years old. Moses, son of Kamukluk Sarah, age 13. Alec, son of Peter Sala, age 8 years. Peter Sala's wife, Anautilik, and her small sons, Moses and Quarak. The senior Quarak's wife and her children remained in their igloo, but Nellie, a 30-year-old widow, and Mary, Quarak's daughter, were also forced out onto the ice by Mina. Even Moses, Mina's husband, who was by now very frightened of his wife, reluctantly followed Mina out onto the ice floe. Mina frightened the group by running around, flailing wildly among them. She was screaming that Jesus was coming. She made all of them take off their parkas and boots. Even her husband Moses complied. After she had led them far out onto the ice, she took the pants off the children and prevented them from reaching or putting back on any of their clothes. Along with several of the other adults, Mina's husband Moses managed to escape. He returned to the safety of his igloo, bringing back one of the children Peter Sala's wife had with her. But unfortunately, Peter Sala's wife, who had also escaped, was only able to bring the youngest of her children back with her to camp, leaving her eldest son Alec behind. Mina returned to the camp as well, telling the six others to stay put, which they did. But unfortunately, all of them perished from exposure. The ones who died were Johnny, Janacy, Alec, Moses, all children, Kamudluk Sarah, Mina's sister, and Nakarak, Mina's mother. When Quarak and his daughter Eva returned from their sealing expedition, they learned of the tragedy. The next day, the bodies found on the ice were brought back in and buried on the island. Mina caused no more commotion. Hmm. Caused no more commotion. Just sick. 
It was God, Peter Sala, who finally tipped authorities about the goings-on among his group. Since Alec Katuiak's murder, Peter had been working for a man named Ernest Riddell, who'd hired him as a guide. Peter led Riddell in his expedition to Great Whale River on the coast of Quebec, where there was a large Hudson's Bay Company outpost. Even though Peter believed himself to be God, he'd later say he felt that he and the rest of the believers had halos, his conscience was bothering him. At Great Whale River, Peter recounted the slayings of Sarah Apokok, the elder Katuiak, and Alec Katuiak to a Métis man named Harold Ungarden. Ungarden told Riddell about Peter Sala's confession, and Riddell sent a telegram about the three deaths to Hudson's Bay Company headquarters in Winnipeg. The company forwarded that message to the RCMP, who sent officers to investigate. So weeks later, they showed up. That also shows the, um, you know, Canada mm -hmm. was built in a lot of ways. Yeah. After white folks came over by the Hudson's Bay Company. Yeah, totally. It was. You know, now it's the Bay, the, the the department store, but owned by Americans. They, you know, they went to the so the Hudson's Bay Company was told before the police are told. That's right. Yeah. Right? That's the power of this company back, even as late as late as the forties, right? The investigators who showed up were shocked to hear that there had been six more deaths since Peter Sala had left the group. He'd only known about three. Mina's husband, Moses, showed the RCMP officers where the survivors had buried the more recent group of bodies. When police asked Peter Sala's wife, Anautilik, why she hadn't brought her son Alec back with her, she said, I tried to, but I was carrying my baby in my arms. I managed to get them all back but Alec. I put his pants back on, but he was too cold to return, and I couldn't carry him. I was frozen myself on the bottoms of my feet. Oh. Like, talk about Sophie's choice, right? That would have been so cold. Yeah, and horrible. Like, she knew, she probably knew she was leaving him to his death. Yeah, of course. You mm -hmm. know, these people know the land, right? And they, right. they know what you're supposed to be wearing. Yeah. After the investigators traveling the island by sled dog had the story straight, they gathered evidence, arrested the alleged perpetrators, and held them for trial. From religious frenzy, the charges were as follows. Alec, Apokok, and Akinik were charged jointly with the murder of Sarah Apokok. Peter Sala and Adlaycock were charged jointly with the murder of Elder Katuiak. Charlie Uyurak and Kwarak were charged jointly with the murder of Alec Katuiak. Peter Sala's sister Mina was charged with the murder of her sister, Kamudluk Sarah, 32, Kamudluk Sarah's sons, Moses, 13, Janassi, 6, Peter Sala's son, Alec, 8, and Peter's adopted son, Johnny, 7, as well as her own mother, Nakarak, who was 55. All these people, mm -hmm. just, you know, over, over a few days, well, weeks, right? Yeah. You know, none of them were murderers before. No. It, it's like this crazy idea took them over. It was like a mind virus, really. So do you think it's, you know, I still don't understand cults. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get it, but I don't get it. You know right. what I mean? Because it obviously happens. Yeah, it happens a lot. And I think, you know, the psychology of this, it's, it, do you think that because, remember when the story started, we're talking about how, people were starving starving right? yeah. the woman's breast milk turned green and yeah. dried up and and so do you think it was sort of that very desperate situation that sort of created a tinder box i think so and people were so desperate and then some people took advantage of it do you think anyone do you think any of these people believed it i think people did believe it do you think anyone didn't believe it but we're playing the part sure of god and all that i bet you that within a lot of cults that happens yeah because it, it benefits them in some way to go along with things. Right. Um, okay, maybe it looks like we're going to be successful here if the, these people are doing their thing. So well, How often do you think a it. cult leader believes it or is just completely like aware that, hey, I'm going to make up this story to take everyone's money? I don't know. I think Jim Jones knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah. 100% believe that he, like, I mean, he knew he was lying. Yeah. He, he set up a whole bunch of situations that made him look like he was godlike. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, he knew he was lying. But uh, I think because he's a narcissist and all that kind of stuff and just wanted what he wanted and loved the adoration, mm -hmm. you know, and I think narcissism plays a big part in, in cult leaders. 
look at the Nexium cult, uh, Keith Ranieri, um, the one that was here in Vancouver, mm. uh, there are people there who you would think these are intelligent, smart folks who got caught up in this thing because this guy convinced them mm. that this was the way things were and that they would succeed in life were they only to follow him. Mm. And that's over and over yeah. and over again how cults seem to work. Mina really went gangbusters, didn't she? She did, yeah. Huh. The trials began on the 19th of August, 1941, in a hastily erected tent in the Belchers. Unfortunately, many of those from the mainland were sick with the flu for the duration of the trial. The harsh environment and sickness burning its way through the encampment made the proceedings even more miserable. From the book, In Those Days, by Ken Harper, quote, The judicial party arrived in the islands on August 18th. Judge Plaxton was from the Ontario Supreme Court, but was also a stipendary magistrate for the Northwest Territories. R.A. Olmsted, from the Federal Department of Justice, was the prosecutor. J.P. Madden, a lawyer from Ottawa, was the defense counsel. Two reporters, one from the Canadian press and one from the Toronto Star, accompanied the party. The trial began the following day. The jury consisted of six white men. I'm, you're thinking I'm going to say and. No, it was just <laughs> six white men. A mining executive, a prospector, the engineer of the HBC vessel Fort Charles. HBC is the Hudson Bay Company. The HBC post manager, and amazingly, both newspaper reporters. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. The trial proceeded smoothly for six of the accused. But when it was time for Mina's trial... She refused to leave her tent and, quote, struggled and screamed and sobbed violently. She had to be carried into court, strapped to a stretcher, end mm -hmm. quote. In his address to the jury, the judge noted what he called the Inuit's easy susceptibility to religious frenzy and hysteria, particularly when they were left alone without religious guidance or police supervision, but pointed out, nevertheless, the criminal laws of Canada were just as applicable to these people as they are to their white brethren, and, end quote. And there you go. That's, that's why I went on my little thing at the beginning yeah. of, of the show, because I knew this crap was going to come Well, up, and right? this is the thing. This is the thing. The, the, essentially, the judge is calling the Inuit people weak-minded. Yeah. But it happens in every society, yeah. like you said before. Yeah. I hadn't got to this part in terms of the script, but I knew it was coming. I yeah. knew it was coming. Yep, it had to. After the trials were complete, the verdicts shook out this way. Alex, a Pawcock, was found not guilty of the murder of his sister, Sarah. So he may have beat her with the snow implement. But she was taken away by she the others. She was taken away, yeah. yeah. Akinik was found not guilty in Sarah's murder on the grounds of temporary insanity. Mm. Peter Sala and Adelaikok were found guilty of manslaughter for the death of Ketuiak. Charlie Uyarak and Quarak were found guilty of manslaughter in the death of Alec Katuiak. As far as Mina went, it was not possible to produce any evidence that Mina was not insane. The panel found her not guilty due to insanity without ever leaving the jury box. It was not possible to produce any evidence that she was not insane. Yes. Wow. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. God, Peter Sala, and Jesus, Charlie Uyarak, received two-year sentences, while Ad Laycock received a sentence of one year, all at hard labor. The men did their time at the RCMP post at Chesterfield Inlet and learned that tribal elders had exiled them from the Belcher Islands. They were no longer welcome in their ancestral homes. Interestingly, Quarak, who murdered his son-in-law by shooting him in the back twice and then in a coup de grace in the head at close range, received a suspended sentence of two years. Korak's freedom hinged on him hunting and providing for Peter Sala's family for the two years that he was in jail. Charlie Uyarak died just a year later, after being admitted to the hospital in Moose Factory for a persistent cough in January 1942. Charlie's conditions steadily worsened. He died in May. Doctors expected to find evidence of tuberculosis at autopsy, but none was present. Akinik and Mina received religious, quote, re-education with the help of a minister named Reverend Nielsen. 
Nielsen, however, did not care for them day to day, though. Making ends meet was up to the women themselves, and they lived essentially in poverty for that time. From the book In Those Days by Ken Harper. Peter Sala, his family, and his sister Mina were moved to the Nastapoca Islands, north of the Richmond Gulf. Mina's husband Moses drowned in the Belcher Islands in the fall of 1943 before he was able to join her. At Laycock, lived in a camp 20 miles north of the Great Whale River. Akine lived in the same camp. Quarak remained on the Belcher Islands. In a brief report in 1944, the RCMP noted that the former prisoners had, quote, been living normal lives. The chief instigators, both while serving imprisonment and since being released, had returned to their natural environment and have conducted themselves in a normal manner and are now following their normal mode of living, end quote. Peter Sala was eventually allowed to return to the Belcher Islands, and he died there in 1990. So, before we go on, let's talk about was justice served. In this case, I kind of think it was. Sure, these people killed people Mm -hmm. in their religious fervor, but their religious fervor was driven by this fear that they were all going to die. I don't know if they would be found insane today. I think the courts might even be more harsh, which is interesting. It's like 1941... And far before woke culture and, and, and looking at uh, mitigating factors and all that kind of thing, it looks like that was what was going on in justice at well, that I time. I find it interesting that one of, them, one of them had to provide for one of the families. Yeah. Maybe they're thinking, this is sort of the case if we go back, go back to a small community. Remember the... Um, mm-hmm. Remember when we did uh, the uh, Black Donnelly? Yes. And there's so many people involved yep. that it would have destroyed the entire community. Right. And maybe there's a little bit of that. Maybe there's a bit of, well, we don't want to like wipe out the entire island by throwing everyone in jail. That's exactly. Need... So I think this is, you know, justice. Maybe there's a little bit of restorative justice there in terms of providing for the other person's It family. seemed to be more forward thinking community wise. Yeah. 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 It's very, very strange. It is. So controversially, author George Bernard Shaw once wrote, The Bible is the most dangerous book ever written on earth. Keep it under lock and key. He also wrote, No man ever believes that the Bible means what it says. He is always convinced that it says what he means. Mm. End quote. So we talked a little bit about that yeah. earlier. Um, there are different reasons why different people think the Bible is dangerous. Uh, For example, Pope Francis a few years ago said the Bible is a dangerous book, but he meant it as the Bible is dangerous because the people who believe it are often persecuted for having it. So that's not what Shaw was saying. George Bernard Shaw was saying it's dangerous because things can be misinterpreted as we see so often. And then you have different groups saying, hey, 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 it's dangerous. So. You know, so we're going to tell you the interpretation you should take. Right, there, exactly. Right? Um, so it's not that dangerous in terms of an individual. It's a, it's dangerous in terms, of, in some ways, it's dangerous in terms of uh, a, a leadership structure mm-hmm. um, a, 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 of various sects, right? Sects, yes. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff in the Bible, mm-hmm. right? Like there's actually some really interesting things that... Uh, yeah, I, I think you just, you have to, you don't have to do anything, but you take from it what you need. If you do it, if you do it with openness, mm-hmm. goodness and open heart, and you're trying to improve yourself yeah, and understand your own actions, mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. But unfortunately it always turns into, um, God hates fags. Yeah, it's sort funny stuff, how it right? always sort of degenerates to right? that. Um, to yeah. that I say, well, if you believe in God, God made fags. So there you go. Yeah. Right? <laughs> the story of Charlie Uyarak, Peter Sala, and their little band of followers is no means of rarity. In the last 50 years, we've had some massive death cults whose followers were slain, killed others, or died by mass suicide. Look at Jonestown, Heaven's Gate, Om Shinrikyo, just to name a few. Cults are even more prevalent today and with far more followers. Scientology. The internet seems to have highlighted how, if a thing, no matter how, if a thing, no matter how delusional, fits an accepted narrative, 
that some people will believe pretty much anything. Take, for example, QAnon. Mm. According to BBC, quote, at its heart, QAnon is a wide-ranging, completely unfounded theory that says President Trump is waging a secret war against elite Satan-worshipping pedophiles in government, business, and the media. QAnon believers have speculated that this fight will lead to a day of reckoning where prominent people such as former presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, or any other liberal leader, will be arrested and executed. Some people believe that the movement was started by trolls who were just throwing out nonsense, but the fact that it's caught on, that some believe every word, highlights the vulnerability of the human mind. (laughs) The vulnerability of some human mind. Well, I don't know. We'll see. It's even leaking across the border into Canada. From the Daily Beast, quote, For people outside the pro-Trump QAnon conspiracy theory, Romana Didulo is just another Canadian citizen. But for her supporters, she is a monarch, ordained by Q and the American military to rule over Canada and ultimately the world. After being endorsed by other QAnon promoters, Didulo managed to amass a following and is currently touring Canada in a fleet of RVs to meet with her supporters. Now, though, Didulo's ambitions seem to have grown. In July of this year, she started telling her more than 60,000 followers on the messaging app Telegram about the establishment of the, quote, Kingdom of America, handing out royal titles to Americans who promised to promote her reign there and appointing a new United States Commander-in-Chief a man named David Carlson, who I have no idea what he's about. While Dedulo's ideas are ridiculous, they've already had a real-world effect on Canada. When she told her fans that she had abolished Canada's income tax, some stopped paying taxes to the Canadian government. Because Dedulo issued a decree announcing that her supporters could now pay their utility bills with IOUs backed by her bogus government, Her supporters have started losing electricity and water in their homes, and some have even lost their homes. Hmm. It's going to be interesting to see what happens to the Queen of Canada and her followers. We all know who the real queen is, old Liz. But I think the QAnon story is just beginning. Didilo, I am the Queen of Canada, darling. Yes. Um, that's just ridiculous. Well, you're the queen of dark poutine. I'm the queen of dark poutine. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Mike, but if you are stupid enough to think that this stupid woman uh, did a decree saying that you don't have to pay your utility bills, your bills should be cut off. You know, come on. You you, you know, if you fall for that shit, then you're going to have to learn a hard lesson. We live in a post-truth world, Matthew. No, we don't. I know we don't. (laughs) No, we don't. I'm saying that to upset you. And the people that like fell into this and like didn't pay their bills, I'm we're laughing at you. Like don't. It's just ridiculous. We're laughing and we're laughing and laughing and you know. And I'm not going to be like, oh, there's poor people. It's like, no, they're morons. And and with that, (laughs) that's the end of episode 233: Falling Stars, the Belcher Island Murders. Matthew loves cults. Oh, my God. (laughs) That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All right. Looks like we have a few voicemails, and I suspect there might be a couple from Newfoundland. Let's listen. Hi, guys. This is Erin. I'm calling from Dildo, Newfoundland. I love your show. Um, Just wanted to call and say how great it was to hear you guys do another episode based out of Newfoundland. Uh, You guys covered the Dana Bradley case early on in your program, which was a really good program. And I was interesting to hear some facts about the tsunami. I've heard of it, it before, but... I never really got into much detail when people had told me about it. Anyway, thanks for uh, covering another story from our neck of the woods. And uh, thanks. Go shit your hat. <laughs> thanks. Bye. So, Matthew, I, there's an elephant in the room, i.e. the place where she's from. Yeah. It is a real place. 
And you know what I love? I, I love how they, you know, with that, that American talk show hosted something and made fun of it and they just embraced it. Sure. <laughs> I've actually never heard it from anyone, anyone from Dildo before. Well, now we've had a caller have, from Have you Dildo. ever known anyone from Dildo? No. No. I'm no I, I knew somebody from Flin Flon. Flin, uh, my friend Art Blomquist is from Flin Flon. Yeah, because mm-hmm. there's there's like five or six really interesting name places in this country. Five or six, and, and I want I want to be friends with somebody in all of them. So, yeah. Aaron, Aaron, will you be my friend from Dildo, please? Yeah, thank you. She sounded nice. Yeah, I'm glad we could uh, give her a show about the um, tsunami as well. Yeah, it's it's it was a fascinating story. Like yeah. I I enjoyed researching that like i'd known about it for a long time but the research of it sort of Get, getting into the details yeah yeah thanks for your call aaron and here's our next voicemail Ah, oh, hey fellas it's great big pete i'm calling you from fortune newfoundland which is way down in the south of newfoundland interestingly enough i was listening today on my way from st john's newfoundland all the way to fortune to the episode where you talked about the earthquake in 1929. And I just seen stuff about that in the uh, Geological Museum yesterday uh, in St. John's. It's pretty cool. So y'all should uh, check it out if you're ever here. It's in St. John's. I think it's called the Johnson Geo Center or something. Pretty neat place. And uh, it was a really long drive. So it was really nice to have your, uh, your dulcet tones of your voices Uh, coming over the airwaves and, uh, you know, listening to some uh, neat stories and recounting some, you know, what would have been really terrifying stories uh, for Newfoundlanders. Anyways, these people, I can truly say, are salt of the earth. Uh, People here, they're super kind and super lovely, uh, especially to the people like us that are from away. Anyways, we'll be on our way tomorrow morning to a ferry that we're going to be taking to St. Pierre and Miquelon. And hopefully when I'm there, I'll be able to get the sound of the guillotine that was used to behead that fella that you mentioned a few episodes back, whose name I've forgotten because I'm stupid. Anywho, that was a long and rambly voicemail from Great Big Pete. Anyways, I love you too. And uh, give my love to Steve. Okay, bye. It's GBP. Great Big Pete. We yeah. do like it when GBP calls in. Yeah, Great Big Pete. And uh, I, I like that he mentioned that he's from away. He, you, you're If you're not from the Maritimes, oh, a particular away. place, you're from away. But there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay to be from away. Yeah. You can be... Aye, you're from away. Yeah. Um, yeah, and when he said he's on a ferry, I was like, Steve would love that. And he, he gave Steve a shout out. So thank you, GBP. Yeah, there you go. Um, and I think... I think we're having a three for three this week. I think this is a new. F- this I think this next call is a new. Look at that! Give a little bit of attention. <laughs> yeah. Hey guys, my name's Damaris. I'm calling from Newfoundland. Damaris. I just listened to the episode, the recent one about the 1929 tidal wave, and it really was something else. I never really knew about it, and just thinking about what I would do if I seen it. Uh, you guys had, um, well, God. it sounds like she bailed on the call. Oh, she bailed. But that's okay. Like you were doing just fine. Um, I think we would, we should, you should, why don't you call in next week? Yeah. Call us, call, call us again. Call again. And just, uh, it's okay. Leave like, us a message. We're just a couple of guys. You know? And yeah, I wanted to hear a take on it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, uh, call yeah. us back, please. Yeah. Call us back. Please but, do. But anyway, uh, that is it for this week's voicemails. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 327 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Uh, let's look at Patreon and... Last week, I got a message on in the Umber Yard. Somebody posted in the Umber Yard saying, you missed me. And it's yes. like, we didn't really miss you. We have to, if we did all the patrons in one week, yeah. then there would be none some weeks. Yeah. So we kind of, we kind we of. We have to it, we spread can, things out We kind out of dole them out a little bit. Yeah. It's like, we have to 
save a little pepper for yeah. next week. Yeah, kind and, of and you are the pepper. So Lacey Boyer. You are the pepper. You are the pepper this week. Um, I don't know where Lacey is from. Have you gathered that? Have you put on your amazing where are people from hat? Yeah, I have. And wh- where is Lacey from? She's from Shitterton, Dorset. Shitterton and Dorset. <laughs> it's a real place. Is that in England? Yes. Okay. And uh, what does she do in Shitterton, Dorset? In Shitterton? Mm-hmm. She's a port poo magnate. Well, there you go. There's good. Or is it port Yeah, I guess in the in the UK it would be port Portaloo or Johnny on the Spot. Johnny on the Spot, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So she's a port poo port ju- Don't magnate. judge her for that. She's making money. No way. She's making money and everybody does it because not everyone shits in their hats. Yeah, there was a, there was, when I worked in the movie business, if I was a second assistant director, I was in a, in an office that was right next to what was called the honey wagon. And the honey wagon is the shitter, essentially. Really? So someone would come and empty the honey wagon every couple of days. Just so, for fun. yeah, like, no, like a, yeah, a, yeah, a truck, big truck thing, yeah. with, with a hose. Yep. And when that guy showed up, let me tell you, every every trailer around that area cleared out. Absolutely. Because it was awful. So I'm sure Lacey, Lacey's pleased that she started this conversation. Well, she's dealing with our shit. <laughs> yes. Anyway, thank you so much, uh, Lacey, for being a Patreon. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Leo. And Leo's from Ehingen, Germany. Deutschland. Deutschland. Um, so what does Leo do there in Germany? I think he I think he's a beer brewmaster. A brewmaster. Is that what they call them? Brewmaster. Brewmeister would be there. Or is it a master distiller? What what does like a master well, beer it, person if do? If you're somebody who uses bait, yeah. uh like fishing bait, you're a master baiter, I think. Oh god. Then No, because <laughs> you're so bad. So I know it's master distiller and there's a brewmeister. Gin, it's gin. brewmeister for beer, okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, Leo is a brewmeister. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Well, good. Um, I'm glad that Leo is doing that for people who can take a drink in safety. I am not one of those people. <laughs> Thank you, Leo, for becoming a Patreon. We really appreciate it. Yes. And um, call in and leave us a voicemail. Yes, exactly. About, about what you really do in Germany. I, yeah. I, I, I kind of want to know now. Yeah, I, I, I like wanna, that too. And, and I want to, yeah, yeah, I want to know what he actually does. And if Leo is German, then he'll have that really cool accent. Like Werner Herzog, he will be wondering why, why the abyss is staring at me. Is Werner Herzog German? Uh, oh my goodness, yes. Uh, it's just because I, I've only ever heard him via you. Yeah. And it's such a bad German accent. I, I didn't do a know good what he was. German accent. I thought you were trying to make him sound Swedish. No. Okay. <laughs> oh, anyway, <laughs> next up, people are going to read you for that. Next up, we have Marianne Codner, and she's from Edmonton, Alberta, right next door. Thank so, you, Marianne. Marianne Codner, what does Marianne do there in Edmonton, Alberta? I think Marianne mm-hmm. is a professional scooter teacher so she teaches so, people how to ride scooters so edmonton get all got all these scooters okay that you can go zip around in and you can just leave them anywhere cool and after it happened mm-hmm. lots of people hurt themselves including people like my aunt Anne, shout out who probably had a little too much and like fell off the scooter oh she was tippling a little oh, bit oh she tippled and tippled off the scooter and i think marianne actually is health and safety trainer for uh the scooter system in well, edmonton that's probably a good idea <laughs> <laughs> but thank you marianne for being a patron we really appreciate it well there you go uh, next we have drumroll drumroll from cambridge ontario not cambridge england Sarah Jones. So thank Sarah, you, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Jones. Jones. So what is Sarah's profession there in Cambridge, Ontario? Is there a university in Cambridge, Ontario? There probably isn't. I don't think there is, Mike. No, but <laughs> there's a really nice one in England. Yes. Just I, so you know. I bet there is. Yeah. So what does she do, Matthew? <laughs> what does she do in Cambridge? Yeah. She's a Parks and Recs person. She's a Parks and Recs person in yeah. Cambridge, Ontario. She's like, what's that TV show? Parks and Recreation? Yeah. She's the blonde one. Oh, uh, Leslie Nope. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, Leslie. Leslie Nope. So Sarah is Leslie Nope. And I am uh because, and she's I'm like, Ron Swanson. And and Sarah's currently trying to get a hole in the ground filled and made into a park. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love Ron Swanson in that. My mustache he, emulates him a little bit, but uh, a I, little. I love his line when he uh, is at a restaurant and he says, bring me all the bacon you have. And then the, as the lady turns to walk away and he stops her, he grabs her arm and he says, I really mean it. Bring me all the bacon <laughs> that you have. <laughs> Lots of bacon. Yeah. So that's what Sarah Jones and it does in lovely Cambridge, Ontario. Well, there you go. Thank you, Sarah, for becoming a patron. We really appreciate it. Next, we have Manjot Singh, and uh, autocorrect corrected Manjot's name to Mango, which is really funny. Uh, but Manjot Singh, we're not sure where Manjot is from, uh, first of all. So where is Manjot from? Kelowna. Kelowna, British Columbia. Yeah. Well, there you go. Okay. And what does Manjot do in Kelowna? Makes cologne. Oh, so it's cologne. Uh, yeah, he's a perfumer. Oh, well, there you go. Yes. A perfumer. A th- yep. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> well, thank you for doing perfume in Thank you so much, Kelowna. Brandon, for doing yes. that and becoming a Patreon for us. Much appreciated. Next up, from East Amherst, Nova Scotia, Carolyn Hollis. Carolyn Hollis! Well, thank you, Carolyn. And what does Carolyn there do there in Amherst, East Amherst, Nova Scotia? I don't. You tell me. What do people do in Nova Scotia? What do they do? Well, generally, people will work um, in the tourist industry. People okay. will work in fishing and uh, the lobster industry. Uh, or she's some, she's the tourist fairy. She's a tourist she, fairy. She has this like white dress and wings mm-hmm. and a little magic wand. And what does she? Do? And if tourist is having some sort of trouble, she, she appears and ding and gets gets them out of the There's trouble. There's gas in your car. Ping. Ding. That's why everyone's going to Nova Scotia right now for free gas there, because of Carol, and she's going to break the economy. There's no, there's no more flat tire. Ping. Ping. Your yeah. your meal is late. Ping. It's <laughs> arrived. Well, that's kind of amazing. Yeah, I think people. Yeah, everyone. Should, every place should have a tourist ferry. Everybody should. Yeah. The next it's time to move on to donut money donors. And first up we have Alexandria Oroz- Orozco. Orozco. Is she Alexandria Orozco? And she says, enjoy Matthew and Mike. Mike, enjoy an Earl Grey donut. Matthew, enjoy a Jellyfield donut. If anything left over, be sure to spoil Steve, Echo, and Waffles. No, so Steve is still first. Yeah. Of course he's first, because he was here first. And he's the big one. He is the big one. Thank you, Orozoko Flow. Yeah. <laughs> say the word, say the word. Oh, God, that horrible in your No, thank you so much. Earl Grey donuts are yummy. So where does Alexandria live? Alexandria in Egypt? Yes. Oh, okay. And does she manage the library there? No, she lives in Tripoli. Oh, okay. <laughs> Because the Orzoka, she's the Orzoka flow. Okay. <laughs> and what does she do? She's a sailor. Well, there you go. We all need sailors. Yeah. Next, she's an adventurer. Next, we have Brittany Trask, and Brittany's from Prince George, British Columbia, and she says, treat yourselves to some donuts or Nanaimo bars or put towards a new hat from all the shit in yours. <laughs> we actually have, a, like, I think we have, like, a harp. I bet... We are the podcast with the highest proportion of Prince George listeners. I would say there's a lot who listen to us from Prince George. Yeah. You're correct. Yeah. It's great. I don't know. Like, I don't know how other podcasts do. I don't really follow. But like, Prince George comes up a lot. I'm not competitive like that, so I don't follow yeah, stats. No, but I just mean like, Prince Georgers, we're here for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Prince George and do an away. We should. Thingy trip. Yeah. We, we totally should. We could do happen? Highway of Tears from up there. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. I heard it done recently by somebody. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Not as, not, as, not as sensitive as it should be. How long of a drive is it? It's like uh, 10 hours. Road trip. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I could definitely go to Prince George. I love it up there. And my friend Art just lives in Indaco, which is just a little bit down the road. You go to Prince George and turn left. We could like, we could do it, make it two days, sort of work our way up there. Sure. 
Okay, we're coming. We're coming at you, Brittany. <laughs> we should. <laughs> anyway, what does Brittany do there in Prince George? She probably works at the mill. She doesn't work at the mill, dude. What does she do? She is the mill runner. Oh, so she's the owner of the mill. Boom. There you go. Good for you. She's up in that little box. Yeah. With a glass window. Nice. Looking looking at everyone, making sure they're doing their thing. That's great. But she also makes sure that people are safe. Nice. So she's she's a good boss. Thank you, Brittany. Thanks, Brittany. Okay. If you get in trouble with Brittany, you're taken to Trask. <laughs> Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us Donut Money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for Dark Poutine. Uh, Until next week. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. And keep your noses clean. And other parts. And your toeses. Your noses and your toeses. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>